You know what I can't stand? When I'm just trying to run this malware campaign and the user is just strolling through his task manager and happens upon evil.exe and just goes right over to it and ends. Like how rude. So we're going to find a way to get around something so simple as just ending the process that says evil.exe with process injection. Welcome back to Reverse Reverse Engineering. This is the series where I am building malware to learn how to defeat it. That is kind of like the, I guess, series introduction in a nutshell. So today we're going to talk about process injection. So process injection is fairly simple, even if it is relatively complicated in practice. So each process, so let's do proc one and proc two. Each process is going to have its own memory, obviously. That's fairly simple, fairly straightforward. That memory is used to store basically pointers to functions. It's used to store local variables and global variables. And that whole memory range is kind of mapped out in a specific way. So we're not going to get just right up into like the concept of memory and this kind of devlog thing, but we are going to talk about process injection. Basically what process injection is, is it's taking my process, another process and writing my process to that other process so that when certain functionality runs within my malware in this case, then it's going to run under the other process and it's going to look a little bit less sketchy. If you're running through your task manager over here and you see like notepad open, you're not going to think really all that much of it. It's just notepad. So if I inject my process into Notepad, then as long as Notepad is running, it's also running my code. So that's what the, po the point of process injection is. It's like the simplest possible way to do stealth. It's also old and it's not perfect. Most antiviruses will actually catch process injection. Um, apparently Malwarebytes doesn't? I don't know. And Defender hasn't pinged me for this either. Um, even though I accidentally left it on. Most of the time, the first thing I do is turn on turn off Defender. But thus far, we're not doing anything just super complicated. I'll show you what we're about to do actually in a second. All we're really going to do with this is show a message box. So let me show you what the end result of this is going to look like. Let's go over to our process injection code, and we're also going to start up Notepad. So I'm using Notepad as an example, but you can actually use several different programs for this. So let's drag over Notepad. So we've got notepad here, we've got our process injection code here, and let's open up task manager. So if we go over to notepad, we can go to its details. And if we see in its details, we've got a PID running. So this PIG, a PID right here is the process identifier. This process identifier is going to be what we use to actually inject into a process. So we can see the PID for notepad.exe is 9408. So let's go back to our code and we're going to change this variable right here to 9408. I think that's the right one. Yeah, 9408. So once we run this, our code is going to inject into the notepad process and it's no longer going to be running under its own process anymore. So let's save this and we're going to go up to start without debugging and it's run, let's open up notepad, and we can see, well, if I can pull it up, and we can see that a message box pops up. Now this message box is not created by notepad. This message box is created in the notepad process using our own program. So as you can actually see right here, the injection entry point is actually the function that we're going to run within the context of notepad and it creates this git module or it grabs the name of the module which in this case is notepad and it prints it out in a message box so just to prove that we do actually have control over this i changed the actual title of that message box to like and subscribe and i'm going to rerun it so let's open up notepad again notepad is open and let's look at what the new process ID is. 20992. 20992. 
All right, and let's run this. You open up Notepad again, and we've got our message box. So as you can see, we do actually control this. This is actually the function that we're injecting into that process. And as you can also see, it is running under the Notepad process because it's printing out the name or the, the kind of file location of the module that it's running under. So if we open up our task manager here, we can look at the processes, we can look at Notepad, and we can see that now our message box is showing up under the Notepad process. All right, so that's kind of the demo. I did the demo up front instead of the demo at the end. Let's walk through this code and explain how it works. So we start out obviously printing out hello world because that's what you do in every program, especially malware. And we are going to get a handle to our own process. Now a handle as explained by MSDN is kind of how, it's, it's one of the things that Windows uses to describe processes. And handles can be used for a variety of different things. They basically hold all of the data that relates to a process in this case. So this get module handle normally would take I believe it's the name of a running process or maybe just the process identifier. You can actually look it up fairly easily now that we have switched over to Visual Studio. Um, you can actually get the docs of this fairly easily. Um, so that actually opens up the source code. Let's go back to here. And instead we can just search it online. So that will open up a window over here, and usually the first result is going to be the Microsoft Docs. So it takes in a module name, so I guess you could pass in like an actual running module name, but if you pass in null, it should be somewhere in here. Let's search for null. If the parameter is null, get module handle returns a handle to the file used to create the calling process. So in this case, if we look back at our code, we're passing it null. So it's going to grab a handle of the process that's currently running. It's going to grab its own handle, which can be incredibly useful, especially for this kind of application. So we're going to grab the DOS header. Now, there's a lot of talk in this particular episode of headers and stubs and things like that. Instead of walking through all of this myself, I'm going to link to several really awesome resources um, that kind of explain a little bit more about PE headers and DOS headers. Essentially, the DOS header is the first thing that appears in most Windows executables. And it is basically a header that is just used to pass off execution to the NT header. The DOS header was used basically for backwards compatibility in order to make sure that programs that were made under the DOS operating system can continue running under newer operating systems. What we're really interested in is the NT header. And as we can see down here, we are using a field within the DOS header called E underscore LFA new. So that is basically a pointer in the DOS header that points to where the NT header starts. And we can actually see this using the debugger within Visual Studio. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here, and we are going to go up to debug and start debugging. So we've got our debugger open, and it has hit our breakpoint. If we maximize this window right here, and we look over, let's see what we're looking for. We are looking for the DOS header, which is right here. Currently it is null because we haven't said anything yet. We are going to step and now it's filled everything in. So this E underscore LFA new is an offset to where the NT header is in memory or in this particular handle. So right now we're peering into the memory of our own program and this long right here, it's a type long, it is basically just an offset that points into the NT header. So now, as we can see with this little arrow right here, we are stopped at the initialization of the NT header. This NT header is going to contain lots of important information that we'll go through here in a second, but I can actually go ahead and show you some of it by pressing F10 again, and we're going to go to the NT header. 
This NT header, like I said, contains lots of very, very important information about our actual process that's running or the, the memory of the process that's running. So we can see right here, we've got a signature and the important stuff that we're going to be looking at is mainly within the optional header. So we've got lots of important stuff here. We've got our magic, which kind of identifies what kind of header that we're looking at. Then we've got the base of the code and the image base. Those are the two very, very, piece, very, very important pieces of information. We're gonna change that to hexadecimal just because it is a memory location. So it's easier to kind of reference it there. So as we can see, this is 7FF6606 for, and then tons of zeros, I think four zeros after that. That is the base of our image, which is the actual process that we're trying to run here. So let's go back to our code. We'll go ahead and stop the debugger. We don't need to worry about running it in its entirety right now. So at the moment, we are here. We are at NT header. We have grabbed that header, which right now for the, the purpose of clarity, all that is is a data structure that holds information about the running process. And it's going to hold lots of important information about specifically where the base of our memory is. If we go back to our whiteboard, let's switch back to Photoshop. If we go back to our whiteboard, this is the memory and it's going to contain lots of addresses and values and blah, blah, blah. And obviously the memory is incredibly important, but each of these has a base address. And this base address is where everything kind of starts in the process. And every single process is going to have a different base address. So proc one's base address might be zero X D E A D. And this one might have zero X B E E F. And the importance of this is going to become very apparent very, very soon. But essentially the base address is used as kind of a, a, a starting point all of the other variables are located at offsets to the base address. So let's just for for the intent that like for the intent of clarity, let's say that each of these memory blocks are 4 bytes long. And let's say we've got a variable here called var 1. Now var 1 if we wanted to access it, we won't necessarily know exactly where it is in memory at runtime because we've got things like ASLR and you've got kind of weirdness of where the actual like memory is loaded. So we won't know exactly where that memory is, but we know exactly where the base is, or at least we know where the base is going to be. Actually, when all of these processes are loaded, the base is adjusted according to where it's loaded in memory, but that's not as important right now. Let's just say we've got our base and it is loaded at that address. The base is actually the base address. So in order to access var1, all we have to do is say 0x d e a d plus an offset. And that offset is 4, 8, 12. So it's, well, no, just 8 bytes. So it's going to be at 0x dead plus 8 bytes. And that is going to be the beginning of var. So we can start moving up and down memory using our base address here. And we can do the exact same thing in our other process. All right, so we've got our DOS header and our NT header. Now, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to start allocating memory. So local image right here is going to be a contiguous block of memory that we are allocating. And what we're going to do is we are going to take our process and map it into that contiguous block of memory. That's all virtual alloc does is it actually allocates memory that we can load stuff into later on. So if we actually go right here, let's see. So if we go to mem copy, that's going to be what actually loads this stuff into memory. So let's play, let's place a breakpoint there and let's go ahead and debug. So we hit our breakpoint and what we're interested in the most is this local image variable because what we're essentially doing here is we're copying our process memory, which is the memory of the currently running process, into this location, the local image location that we created using virtual alloc. So if we press F10 here to skip to after memcopy actually runs and we go to local image right here, 
that is a pointer in memory to where all of this stuff was loaded in. So if we copy that and we open up our memory dump, we paste it, and that's not working. There we go. So if we look at this location in memory, we see that it starts with an MZ. Now this is kind of weird and it's like, basically this is a magic value that represents an executable. Anytime you actually open up an executable and for example, like notepad or something like that, you're going to see that it starts with MZ. And all that does is that is the DOS header that basically identifies it as an executable. You can actually see later on, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. That's another part of the DOS stub. So this right here is basically showing that at this address, this pointer that we looked at in locals, so this local image is a pointer to an area in memory where we are loading our own executable. So let's go back to our whiteboard and clear it out real quick and let's explain what's going on. So basically what we're doing with virtual alloc is we are creating a, a, a contiguous block of memory. And what contiguous means is it is just a block of memory that is all in one place. So we are taking this block of memory and we are reading from our own program. So we've got our program here and we are reading from our own, our own program. So we're reading from our executable and we're putting it in this contiguous block of memory. Starting at, let's look at what that location was. So that is 26175, 26175, and 9A and four zeros. 9A, one, two, three, four. So that is a memory location that is the beginning of our executable. So this is going to start with MZ and it's just going to be a bunch of random gibberish because this is all binary. So we are loading that into this location and it's going to become very clear why here in a second. So we're allocating that memory. We are copying it over from our process, which is proc, and we are loading it into that memory address. Now we're going to do essentially the exact same thing, functionally the same thing with a target process. The target process is the actual process that we're trying to inject into. So we're going to use open process, which you can also look at the docs for on MSDN. Um, the MSDN docs are vital to anything Windows programming, but you can look at this on the MSDN. Basically, it's, it's going to take a couple of flags and the big important one is the process identifier. So we are hard coding our process identifier here, um, 20992, that corresponds to notepad if we look at our task manager. So, well, we're gonna have to restart it anyways. Um, let's end this part and see if it keeps notepad open and doesn't break anything. Yeah, it does, huh. Okay, so if we go back, look at notepad, we've got 20992 is our process identifier. So this opens, if I can find it again, this opens that process's memory and we're able to start messing with that process's memory as long as we have the correct access rights to do that. So there is security involved here, but we're able to not really worry about it right now because we're not doing anything super dangerous. We're not trying to escalate privileges or anything like that. And we're going to actually allocate memory within that process. So we've got our target image process handle right here. This is a handle to that process. And we're going to actually start allocating memory within that process. So if we look over here back at our whiteboard, let's erase this. So we've got our virtual allocated memory here, vert alloc, and that is one contiguous block starting at that big long memory address that we talked about earlier. Then we've got our target process. And it's also got memory that we are going to allocate into. And we are using that handle right here as basically a pointer into that process. Um, this, this handle right here, we're essentially just using as a, a pointer into that process's memory. And the size of the actual block of memory that we're trying to reserve here is loaded in using our NT header. 
this NT header is part of our original process. So the process that's running, it has an NT header that has a size of image variable. If we look down here at our locals, we can go to our NT header somewhere right here. And it says it's in the optional header and the size of image. So this is the size of our image. It's 28,000 um, bytes, it looks like. Um, so that's the size of our image. It is allocating that much memory. So basically, if this is 28,000 bytes, I don't think that's actually right. It's significantly more than that. Let's change this over to an integer. I knew I was wrong on that. So it's actually 163,000 bytes. So 163,000 bytes roughly. And it is going to take a block in memory of the target process of that size. So 163,000 bytes. So that is the size of the block of memory that we're allocating. Because what we're essentially going to do is we're going to copy our entire image over into that contiguous block of memory within the process. So that's going to be what we do down here. Now, here's where it gets complicated. So like I was saying before, let's go back a ways. Well, we may not be able to. So like I was saying before, everything has got its own base address. So we've got process one and process two. Everything has got its own memory and its own base address. And that base address dictates how you access all of the other variables and functions and things like that within the function within the process itself. So since we've got this base address and since these two are not equal, any two processes are not going to have the same base address, we've got to start relocating stuff here. Why? So let's say we've got var1 and var1 is at offset four from the base address. So let's call this base one, base one plus four is equal to the location. We're gonna use the ampersand because that's what you use to reference locations and pointers um, within C++ and that is the location of var one. So that is the base address plus four bytes equals the location of var one. Then you've got process two. It's got a different base address and let's say we've got var2 in here. If we wanted base two plus eight, because that's four, four plus eight is equal to the address of var2. If we took an area of memory within process two and inserted process one into it, so if we took this area of memory. Let's start erasing stuff to make some room. And we allocated some memory here. Now we're at a different base address. And that's not good. Because we're at a different base address, this base one variable doesn't matter anymore because we're dealing with base two. So now we've got base two and we've got plus four, plus four, plus four. And then let's just say way on down the line, you've got plus 128, and then you've got var1. Well, now we've got to do a completely different set of math with this. So here's how this works. And I'm going to explain it as well as I can, even though it's something that I am just learning myself. Within each process, you've got what are called, they're, they're essentially offset tables. And we talk about that down here. These are called relocation tables, but they, the, the, important part within here is offsets. And basically what this table says is you've got a list of variables and functions and things like that within this table. And this is, let's just call it a symbol. And you've got func2 and let's say var3. So you've got all of these things and you've got offsets. And these offsets are located based upon the base address. So it's going to be base plus 18 is where var1 is. And then base plus 24 is where func2 is. And base plus 
48. So that's going to be the offset where all of these different symbols are within the original function. So when you load them somewhere else, just in normal, you know, kind of program running, it doesn't know exactly where the base address is, but it does know where the offset is. So if it can find the base address within its own kind of like function memory, within its own headers, then all it has to do is add that offset in order to find where everything is. So if base one is originally 140, but then base one moves. So later on down the line, base one moves to 280, we can still find var1 because var1 is located at the base address plus 18, regardless of where that base address is. So we know that var1, or the location of var1, is at 280 plus 18, which is equal to 298. Now, why does this matter with process injection? This matters because our base address is going to change, obviously. So once our base address changes, once we take our process memory here and move it into process two, which has a completely different base address, so we've got a completely new base address, we already know where all of the offsets are going to be. So if it's got its own functions here, and they don't really matter as much, but down here is where we actually start allocating memory. Right here is where we start allocating memory. We have our offset table that's going to tell us where everything is. We just have to base it all off of the offset. But what we have to do in order to do that is to actually rebase that stuff, to actually relocate everything in memory. So let's walk through it in the code because oddly enough, it's actually more clear in the code than it is on the whiteboard. So we're going to actually look into this relocation table right here. I actually have some extra code that I don't need. Let me get rid of that. So I'm printing out that this is where we're actually starting to perform our rebase. But before that, we are calculating a couple of things. This delta image base is the difference between the location and memory of the target image and the location and memory of our process. So it basically takes the two base addresses of the two processes and calculates a delta between them, the difference between the two. And we're going to use that to actually offset everything in memory because basically if, let's erase all of this, if our base address is originally is equal to 0x40, and when we put it into memory, our um, process to memory, and its base address is 0x56, then the difference is going to be 0x56 minus 0x40. And that's going to tell us what the difference between those two are. Um, and that difference is going to be used to actually rebase everything. We're going to basically add that delta amount to the addresses of everything that we're rebasing into process two. So whenever we insert all of this stuff in, it's going to be where it originally was. So base and plus four, eight, 12, var one is at plus 12. Now, once we put it into memory, it's going to be at 12 plus the delta, because now we're adding this delta right here. So it's a little confusing, but if you look at the code and you stare at it long enough and you drive yourself absolutely insane staring at it, it's going to make a little bit more sense. So we're taking this relocation table, which is something that's actually within our images um, or, or our, our executables here. We're going to take that relocation table right there, and we are going to start walking through the blocks. Now, like I said, there's a specific kind of structure that these relocation blocks take. And honestly, it's best to look at some of the pictures that I'm going to leave in the description to understand that. Um, but you can also look at this structure right here. Basically, every entry within the base relocation table is going to have an offset and a type. 
for our current use case, the type doesn't matter all that much. We're really just worried about this offset. As you can see in our code, we actually don't even mess with the type at all within this case because we don't really need it. That's something the operating system uses for other, you know, other use cases. So here we're going to actually start walking through every single block of the relocation table and that the blocks contain the actual entries that we're going to have to um, patch essentially. And patching, all patching is, is changing things within the memory of a running process or within the memory of an executable. Um, so we're running through all of those relocation entries right here. This is just a basic for loop that we're using to run through each entry. And as we're marching through those, we're getting the address and we are adding that delta right there. And that delta is, like I said, the difference between the base addresses of the two processes. And after that, we are going to have a perfectly structured block of memory that we can just write straight to the new process. This isn't necessarily supposed to be like the perfect end all to beat all kind of explainer of how this kind of process injection process works. I'm going to leave tons of resources in the description for you to understand a little bit more. I definitely recommend going in and looking at how this kind of like relocation process works. It's something that I understand well enough to code it out here, but I don't understand well enough to kind of explain it to you better than all of the experts that I'm going to leave in the description. So here we're actually writing that process. So we're going to write the local image into the target pro target process and target image, um, and we are you know basically telling it what size you know how much memory that we're going to actually write. And right here, I was just using this for a debugger. That's just basically going to tell you, hey, if you had any errors, this is going to give you an error code that you can look up on the MSDN, not find anything, and then just pull your hair out. Um, and now, this is the actually like actual important point. Now we are actually creating a remote thread within that process. So last time when I ran this, you saw underneath Notepad, Notepad had its own thread, its own main thread that was called untitled-notepad, and then it had something else under it. I'll show that right here. So let's do debug, start without debugging, because we're not worried about debugging right now. So it runs, and if we go back and look at our task manager, now it's got a separate entry right here. These are separate threads. So it's got its main thread here, and then we've got a secondary thread, which we created right here, this create, create remote thread function call. And we are creating a thread within the target process. We've got a couple of flags here that you can look up on the MSDN if you want to. But here is where we're actually, we're actually telling it what function we want to write. So this injection entry point right here is the function that we've got up here. And we're adding, obviously, the delta um, so that we make sure that we're, you know, we're talking about it relative to its new space within the new process's memory. And, you know, we pass in a couple more flags. Like I said, look those up on MSDN. It doesn't necessarily matter all that much because they're all null, but look it up and make sure that you understand how all of that works. And then we've got an error to make sure that, you know, I can debug this stuff later. And this standard out is basically just saying we're done. We have reached the end. So that's a long ass recording. This has gone on for 37 minutes. So all of this, the whole purpose of all of this is to get our malware's functionality to run within another process. That can be used for stealth, it can be used for privilege escalation, it can be used to kind of start stealing stuff out of that process's memory. There's tons and tons of different reasons for doing this, but it is important. If you liked the kind of format that I used for this, let me know. Um, it obviously was a very long explanation, um, and I don't love that it took forever to kind of explain all of this stuff, and I was probably super redundant. But if you liked the kind of explanation style that I went for here, let me know. If you would rather just kind of see a, hey, this is what I got done, if you're interested in reading more about it, here's a bunch of stuff in the description, let me know that too. I, I, I really don't care either way. I'm learning this stuff, and I'm learning a ton from it, but you know, if you don't really benefit from a super long video, then just let me know. I don't even know how many people make it this long into the video. Thank you so much for watching. 
leave me a like and subscribe if you enjoy this stuff. You know, it helps me out a ton, kind of lets me know what people like watching. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Take it easy. Peace. <laughs>